My name is Sam Vaknin, and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. In his programmatic and data-laden tome, Capital in the 21st Century, published this year, Thomas Piketty makes several assertions, two of which merit a closer look. One, that R, the return on capital, is, in the long run, always greater than G, growth in the real economy, thus enriching the rich. The second assumption is that inherited wealth tends to create a patrimonial form of capitalism, akin to the aristocracy in the French and British Ancien Regime. Putting aside the somewhat artificial and dubious distinction between the real and the financial economy, R and G are apples and oranges, and cannot be compared. Economic growth, G, is not the return on the real economy in the same way that R is the return on capital and its assets. R is intended to compensate for a panoply of risks and is comparable to the wave function in quantum mechanics. R incorporates all the publicly and privately available information about future uncertainties and provides a distribution function of all plausible scenarios. Put simply, subject to political and market vicissitudes, capital can vanish overnight. Not so the real economy. It is always there, regardless of upheavals, political meddling, taxation, inflation, which is a form of tax, and disruptive technologies. Capital, wealth, can be construed as a call option on the real economy, and especially on real estate and emerging technologies. R, the return on capital, amounts, therefore, to the premium on this call option. Income inequality is growing because of the decline in the role and importance of labor, which is being gradually supplanted by capital assets, such as robots and computers, as well as being offshore, outsourced, outsourced and downside. Labor is no longer important. Put simply, capital can buy a lot more labor nowadays than it used to, hence the apparent lopsidedness of the distribution of wealth. Luckily for the 99%, the bulk of the nation's wealth is inactive. It is dormant in deposits and other long-term assets, or languishing in hordes of cash in the form of non-distributed profits. Such capital exercises political clout and muscle, but is irrelevant in terms of wage compression. Inherited wealth is no different to any other form of capital. It is merely an extension of the investment horizon a kind of guaranteed immortality. If Warren Buffett lives to be 300, or hence what's left of its wealth to future generations of Buffetts, is immaterial in terms of economic impact. Who owns the capital is not an issue, not relevant. There is no evidence that inherited wealth is less productive and less active than riches obtained via entrepreneurship. Such claims have more to do with, with seething envy than with scholarly erudition. Inherited wealth concentrated in the hands of the few may be compared to an oligopoly. An oligopoly is not necessarily a bad thing. There is no basis to prefer one type of economic activity over another on strictly scientific grounds. Investment, capital activities are as important as entrepreneurship, and finance is as crucial to modern economy to a modern economy as manufacturing. Wealth, inherited or not inherited, is always invested, either in the financial sector or in the real one. To rank economic activities as more or less preferable is ideology, not science. A judgment that is driven by values and predilections it cannot be driven by hard data. Similarly, to talk about a monolithic, immutable oligarchy is laughable. Any casual perusal of Forbes' list of richest people would show that the mobility inside this group is remarkable and its composition is in constant flux. So there is no monolithic, immutable oligarchy. Most of its new members, the new members of this so-called oligarchy, are there by virtue of wages and bonuses. It is true 
that this nouveau riche and arrivis raised the thorny issue of agent principal conflicts. How the executive class institutionalized the robbery of their firms and their shareholders and rendered this plunder a fine art. This is a travesty, and it may be one of the main engines of skyrocketing income equality, together with the venality of politicians in an increasingly plutocratic world. It is a political failure, not an economic one, and it has to be tackled and resolved politically. No amount of taxation, progressive or flat, and no quantity of transfers from the state to the poor will solve the issue of income inequality. The state should encourage wealthy people to invest and to create jobs. It should penalize them, if they do not, by taxing their wealth repeatedly. It should help the poor, and there is very little it can do besides that. 